So I saw this great film this last <laughs> weekend, right, for the third time. And uh, it's called Puss in Boots. Maybe you've seen it by DreamWorks Animation. And so there was one scene in this particular film that I thought was really interesting. And so it was when Puss in Boots, Kitty Softpaws, and Humpty Dumpty, they had stolen the magic beans, right, from Jack and Jill. And they had gone to this special place on the map, put these beans in the ground, they dug a hole, covered it up. And then the thing happened, right? And so Kitty Softpaws says, I heard plants have emotions. Why don't you try saying something supportive? And so Humpty Dumpty leans down very carefully and says very tenderly, hey, little plant. And whoosh, this beanstalk shoots out of the ground and up to the sky. Now, I think this scene is really cute, but it's pretty much what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, do plants make decisions? Can they show preference? And possibly, do they show emotion? And so when people often think of plants and plant intelligence, they put them on this hierarchy. And so we have humans at the top, then animals, maybe microbes, and then plants. Maybe what's on the other side is rocks, right, having no intelligence. And so what I'd like to see is see plants seen for their intelligence more closer to microbes or animals than to rocks. And so when I talk about plant intelligence, I don't mean intelligence by design. I don't mean some sort of clever evolution. But I'm talking specifically, can plants make decisions and show preference when they're put in a system and allowed to do so? And so I'm not the only person interested in this. There's also Stefano Mancuso. And so he gave a TED talk called The Roots of Plant Intelligence. So he's the founder of what's called plant neurobiology. And so he looks at the bioelectrical impulses of plants from their roots. And this is Charles Darwin, very, held in very high regard by science, the writer of The Origin of the Species. And so what you may not know is that later in his life, he wrote a book called The Power of Movement of Plants. And Charles Darwin said specifically that the radical of the plant acts just like the brain of one of the lower animals. Everybody has the bulletin, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has the bulletin, right? Yes. yes, yes. And so I'm not really interested in looking at it from a scientific perspective, but I'm very informed by what's going on in science. But I'm more interested in looking at this particular kind of issue through the lens of art. And I think there's some interesting things that can happen because of this. One thing is, I'm not bound by the same types of granting agencies or institutions or regulations, this type of thing that scientists might be bound by. And as an artist, it's more important for me to produce something that's culturally significant rather than profitable or a product. And so going back to some of the history of the thought about plants and botany, plant biology, you can go back to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle said the big differentiation between animals and plants was that plants were lacking movement. So today, obviously we know this isn't true, right? We know plants are moving all over the place. You just can't see it in human time, right? So here we see a time lapse of this plant moving very deliberately. There's also plants such as this mimosa pedusa, and so this plant will react real time, so this isn't a time lapse or anything. When you touch it, it will actually collapse real time in response to that stimuli. And so what I propose is maybe we should look at these ideas of plant intelligence from some different perspectives and maybe use some different strategies. And so one of these strategies is that of emergence or emergent systems. And so the classic example of this is the slime mold. And so the slime mold is a microorganism that self-assembles into kind of a larger meta-organism in certain states and then disperses. And so this baffled scientists for years because they were looking for the leader, they were looking for the brain. They wanted to know who led this progression of this change into this larger organism that can be seen with the naked eye. And so what they found when they stopped looking for that controller, they found that these are actually self-assembling. And that rather than there being a brain in control, there's a set of simple behaviors that drives a much more complex action. 
And so the other thing I think we can look at as well is this idea of the rhizomatic plant. And so what that means, it's like a tuber. There's also rhizomatic roots. And so it's a root system in which you have specific organisms or copies of that organism, however you want to think about that, growing up independently, but all attached together. And so what we're looking at here is a 107-acre organism. Now, they say this organism, and it's a series of aspen trees, they say that this organism is up to 80,000 years old. And so I think there can be a lot learned by looking at plant intelligence and looking at the way they communicate by looking at them as a system rather than independent organisms. And so the other thing I'm very interested in, in as an artist is this idea of the cyborg. And so you may have heard you know, of the Terminator, maybe you're thinking of Robocop, maybe there's some more contemporary examples. But when I say cyborg, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about an organism that's able to be augmented with technology, that's able to use that technology for its own means. And so this is kind of my first experiment into this idea of the cyborg plant. And so this was a way of aestheticizing the process and looking at how can I augment this plant and run experiments on it while it also being an art object. And so going back to Aristotle, so we know plants are moving, right? That's not really the question. But today, the idea is what differentiates plants and animals. And that's really the lack of mobility. And so I've been thinking a lot about this. And I've been thinking, well, what happens? What happens when you give plants mobility? What happens when you level that playing field with animals? You know, where would they go? Would they move in herds? Would they be solitary? Would they prefer certain areas? Maybe they would prefer the city or the country, right? And so this, for me, is really important in where that lens of art comes back. And so there's two things as an artist that I'm very, very interested in. One, I'm very interested in asking these types of questions. And two, I'm very interested in creating these types of things. Thank you.